you know, because the 50s, 40s, and 30s had the issues in Brown, and then what followed the tumultuous years following the latter 60s and on. And so between 1960 to 65, 66, you were kind of in the eye of the storm, and there wasn't as much uh, walk out, sit in type of unrest, at least at Highland Park. Yeah, we had uh, uh, representation. In fact, I was homecoming king uh, oh, wow. my senior year, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that was kind of unheard of in some of the other schools. And so, um, having uh, experienced uh, African Americans on student council, uh, some being student co student council presidents, there was some representation. Now, was there a lot? Uh, no, uh, some of that was. Um, on us, and some of that was on them. Uh, our reluctancy, fear, call it what you like, of stepping out in, in a white environment uh, sometimes precluded or prohibited us from being all we could have been. Right. I, you know, I've, I've, I've looked at that, having uh, been principal at Highland Park High School and principal at the junior high school, um, there, there was a certain aura about Highland Park that was a little different. Highland Park used to be outside of the city, and Highland Park never wanted to be a part of the city. So it was kind of us versus them, the country folks versus the city folks, and they took pride on being more. And so I think there was some of that in there. And, and I think they took pride on being more welcoming because people knew about the Ramblers and having to play their games in different places and not being able to play at Topeka High School right. while at Highland Park, that was not an issue. Hmm. When I went to college, uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted to be. And I started out as a business major. And I thought those were the most boring courses you could ever take. There was no interaction, there were ledgers and accounting, there's personal finance. And um, one summer, I had the opportunity to work at a playground, William Allen White in Emporia. And I, my job was to create activities for the kids. And I would do that, and when the truck came around to pick up the stuff, I was never ready because I was having so much fun with the kids, playing the activities and so forth. And at the end of the summer, I couldn't dread going back to the business department. So I went in and talked to an advisor who was a sports fan, uh, Dr. Waters, and I said, uh, what can I do that allows me to work with kids and get paid? He said, you should teach. And I said, no, I can't teach. I haven't you know, always um, committed myself uh, to the academics like I should. He said, and that's why you'd make a great teacher, because you understand. And once you get it, you'll be able to help others get it. And that was my entree into the field of education. Plus, those people around, the Ann Garvins and those people and the teachers that I had who were such strong models. And really, frankly, I didn't think I could live up to it because they were such, you know, the main Williams and uh, Miss McBriars and Miss Crawfords and Miss Montgomery's and L. Dorothy Scotts and all of these people. I can go on and on with names and the Ann Garvins. I mean, wow, those are big shoes. Mm -hmm. But what I found once I got in and I realized that a lot of success and a lot of things starts with your heart. And if you have the heart to want to do it, the passion to want to do it, you'll figure out how to do it. And so I had all those things, and I relearned what I didn't learn when I should have learned it, and the rest is history. My first assignment uh, was Parkdale Elementary School. <laughs> the climate was such, um, 70s, you know, we were wearing bell bottoms and floral shirts, and I uh, believe it or not, I had hair and sideburns and so forth. I and, and, <laughs> yeah, and I remember going, uh, reporting for my job, and I walked in, and the principal happened to be a white male, pretty straight lace, you know, black pants, uh, white shirt, little skinny black tie. 
and we talked and so on and so forth. And at the end of the day, he asked if he could talk to me. And I said, well, sure. And he stumbled around and I said, well, what is it? Uh, I was just wondering, are, are you gonna dress like this when you come to work? And are you gonna shave? Um, and I said to him, I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, these are the clothes that I have. And as far as shaving, my grandfather had a mustache, my father had a mustache, and I too would like to have a mustache. And he never said another word. Okay. And it was just interesting. So just kind of give you a flavor of the times, the dress errors, the, the, the changing of the guard, so to speak, between uh, how educators were in the past, particularly white educators, and this new wave of educator coming in mm -hmm. with the passion and wanting to do things. For example, I used to make a little money in college cutting hair. So as an elementary te uh, uh, teacher, I used to cut students' hair. And uh, Friday after school, 25 cents, you get your hair cut. Mm -hmm. And so this went on for about a year, and then one day he called me in and said he didn't feel like it was uh, appropriate to be cutting hair in school. So uh, East Lawn had just been built across the street, and Juan Poppy Abbott was there. And he said, Kush, you can come over here and cut hair. And so we figured it out. And so it was those kind of things you do when you have passion. You don't just teach the kids in the classroom, but you're part of their lives. And that piece of it will always stick with me uh, wherever I go was how some teachers saw their job from eight to three and how some never leave it. Mm 